Hi everybody and welcome to this video taking a look at the brand new features inside Nuke and NukeX 6.3 v7. This release, besides of course including a multitude of bug fixes and speedups, is going to take a step towards ensuring better integration and interoperability with the no doubt diverse range of tools that you probably have in your current pipeline. Now there are going to be four videos in total, first of all taking a look at our improved layered PSD handling, then the new and frankly awesome open colour I.O. features, the extended render man integration that we've introduced for Nuke X, and last but by no means least, the new multi udim functionality which is going to come in extremely handy to those of you using Mari or the Nuke Mari bridge. So let's jump in by first of all taking a look at what we can now do with those layered PSD files. So whilst you could of course bring in PSD files in any previous version of Nuke, in Nuke 6.3 v7 we've vastly extended that functionality, meaning that you can work closely with your matte painting team, with your texturing artists, and avoid that nasty time spent converting between different file types, which is something I'm pretty sure we all hate at this point. So let's have a look at this in action. So in this comp, as you can tell by my nice blue backdrop, I need a PSD file. In fact, I need this PSD file that I have here. Now on the right hand side of the screen, you'll see that it's, it's a pretty standard PSD file. Uh, we've got some layers, we've got layers with masks, and we've also got a few adjustment layers as well. Now whilst you are still going to have to manually bake down these adjustment layers, we no longer have to rasterize or bake in these masks, because 637 is going to take that over for us to use directly within comp. Now the other thing, quickly before I switch back to Nuke, is the fact that as we can tell by this little 16 up here, this is in fact a 16-bit PSD file. And whereas previously we wouldn't be able to bring those in at all, we can now bring those in perfectly within Nuke. So I'm going to switch back into Nuke, and we're going to go ahead, I'm going to hit R to bring up our read dialog, I'm going to select my PSD file and click open to bring it in. Now if I view this, I can come up to my layers drop down list, which is this drop down here in the top left hand corner of the viewer, and inside of here we have access to all of the layers that we had available within our PSD file. So for instance, if I wanted to view radar front, I could select that, we could see the colour information here, and if I hit A, which is something I'm sure you all know, we would view our transparency or alpha information. Now, a minute ago I said it brought over those masks as well, so where exactly is it putting that information for us to use? Well, I'm going to hit A to toggle back to RGB, I'm going to come up to this drop down here, and inside of here, what you'll notice is that why most of these layers have something like red, green, blue, and alpha channels, some of them are also going to have a dot mask channel directly within that layer. Now this is the rasterized mask information that's coming over directly from Photoshop, and I'll show you in a minute exactly how we can use that. So with that done, I'm going to come up to my layers list, and switch us back to RGBA. Now if you had to manually go through and shuffle out every single one of those layers within our PSD file in order to say manually grade one or two of the layers within Nuke, well that's going to take at least me quite a long time to do. So in 637 we've introduced a new bit of functionality that's going to really really speed that up for you. So I'm going to grab my PSD file and drag it up above my comp here just to give us a little bit of room to play with. Uh, and then I'm going to come over to our properties bin and at the very bottom of our read panel you can see that we've got this brand new PSD options set section, inside which there is a single button called Breakout Layers. Now when I click this, Nuke's going to go ahead and loop through every single layer within that PSD file, separate it out into a nicely named backdrop, which of course is very very easy to find at this point, and shuffle out that data for us. So for instance, if I want to come over and look at that radar front section, you can see it's very easy to see it's this one here. So at the top here we have the original PSD file, so nothing is going to change in the viewer. But underneath that, Nuke's gone ahead and added in a shuffle node, shuffling out the information exactly like we had before. Now underneath this, it's added a very important crop node. And this is important because if we manually merge all of these different layers together without a crop, Nuke is going to have to evaluate every single thing we see in the frame, every single pixel, so 1920 by 1080, for every layer we have in our PSD file. Now with the crop node, what's happening is that when we hit breakout layers, Nuke's looking at the data that's in that specific layer and cropping down so we only evaluate exactly what we need to. And this is a great thing for optimizing render times later on down your comp tree. So underneath that we have a brand new node called the PSD Merge Gizmo, and inside of here you get access to a few other parameters that are available to us per layer in the PSD file. So if we open this up and take a look, you'll see that the first one we have access to is the Operation or Blending Mode. And in here, although this is set automatically of course by our Breakout Layers function, we have access to other blending modes that are available to us within Photoshop, in fact almost all of them are in here and they match very closely. 
Now underneath operation we have mask, so just like Nuke's regular merge node, you can of course mask a merge operation, but remember I said that that rasterized mask data is coming into uh, Nuke here from Photoshop, so that on some of these layers is also being set automatically, so that foreground.mask channel is being added in here by the breakout layers. Now finally, underneath that, we have the mix value or the opacity value per layer coming in from Photoshop. And this is, again, set automatically, but we now have full control over this. We can animate it, put expressions on it, and do whatever we want here directly within Nuke. So let's take a look at the final image. I'm going to come over here and click on my bottom right most PSD merge file, and we should see the full thing merge together as we do here. Now the beauty of Nuke doing all of this work for us is that it's now much, much quicker to go in and make individual changes on a per layer basis. So let's say we liked this uh, visor HUD at the top here, but we wanted to change it just slightly. We could come in and very easily find that section, so it's this bit here. Underneath my crop node, I'm going to start off by putting in a transform by using the T key. I can then come up and whilst viewing my final result, I can just add in something here like 10 to start moving this up out of my scene. And then of course I can come in and individually start moving that up using my up and down arrow keys. So say you've done a bit of a transform, maybe you want to put a bit of a grade on there as well. So we could come in, and maybe start gaining it down or up to change the look of the file whilst viewing that final result again. So this is just a quick look at the improved layered PSD functionality available to you within Nuke and NukeX 6.3 v7. Version 6.3 v7 of Nuke now supports OpenColor.io, the open source color management format originally developed at Sony Pictures Imageworks. For those of you unfamiliar with the tech, OCIO enables color transforms and image display to be handled in a consistent manner across multiple applications in your pipeline. It's something that we've introduced into all of our products here at the Foundry, and it's also available in other industry standard applications such as Silhouette, for example. So let's take a quick look at the integration in Nuke itself. So as you can see, I'm playing back this footage up here in my viewer, and one of the most important aspects of that is the color space that we're applying to the image before it's displayed on our screen. And to affect that within Nuke or change it, we can use this menu here called the Viewer Process menu. Now inside of here by default you'll have three options, None, sRGB and Rec 709. However, like most things in Nuke, this is completely extensible via Python and Gizmos, which explains my custom Gamma 2.2 option at the top of the list. However, if we start introducing OpenColor.io into the equation, suddenly this menu can become much more powerful. So I'm going to start off by coming up to my Nuke Preferences. Inside of here, I'm going to hop over to the Viewers tab, and at the very top, we have three options now kind of pertaining to the OpenColor I.O. integration. At the very top of the list, we have Viewer Process LUTs. Currently set to Nuke Root LUTs, this describes what we can currently see within this list. However, if I switch this to OCIO, what we're going to do is enable the use of OpenColor I.O. LUTs within the Viewer Process dropdown. Now, initially, this isn't going to change much because this second dropdown is set to Nuke Default, so none, sRGB, and Rec. 709. However, inside of here, we have several other configs or groups of LUTs that we can use either per facility or per project across not only this application, but other ones as well. So let's say we wanted to use the Sony Pictures Imageworks VFX config. I could click that option, and inside of our Viewer Process dropdown, we now get access to many, many more LUTs. Another way to use this is to set custom at the bottom of here, and we can now set this to a config.ocio file, inside of which describes a group of LUTs again, which is going to change the contents of our dropdown. In addition to the extended viewer process options that we've got up here, we've also introduced five OCIO nodes into 6.3 v7, so I'm just quickly going to take you through each one in turn. First of all, we have a CDL transform node, which is going to allow you to apply an ASC CDL grade via the file input here, alter some of these options, and then if you wish, you can export it as a .cc file. We have the file transform node, which is going to again allow you to apply a transform from a file, and if I come up to the help menu at the top here, you'll see all of the many, many different supported formats. In the middle, I have a log conversion node, so of course log to lin or lin to log if you want, and this is using OCIO, of course. Over here, we also have a color space node that will allow you to convert from one color space to another. For example, if you were to turn on the raw checkbox in a read node, this technique could be used to linearize data using OCIO itself. And finally, we have OCIO display, inside which you can choose a display device. In this case, I'm only using my default screen, of course, and you can choose the color space and viewer transform applied for that display device in the dropdown. So that is the brand new OpenColor.io support available to you within 6.3 v7.
As part of NukeX 6.3 v7, we've extended our render man integration, allowing you to modify or inject rib data from directly within the comp before passing out to render time. So I'm quickly going to show you the node we'll be using for this over here in this first example, and it is in fact the modify rib node. Now if I open this up, you'll see that inside of here at the very top, we've got three options that we can set. First of all is the operation mode itself, currently set to object, so kind of the global parameters of the rib node. We can also choose shader, replace, and world, and I'll be showing you those in a second. Secondly, we've got archives, so we can point directly to a .rib file if we so choose. And thirdly, we have a statements field, so in this case, I'm changing the shading rate of the current renderer. The second example in here is going to be using the shader operation mode. So let's quickly look at the final result, and you can see it's uh, pretty much exactly what we had before. But inside the modify rib node, I've changed the operation to shader, and I'm applying the R marble shader. So if I go ahead and enable this node, of course we change the shader applied to the object. The third mode available to you is replace, and here you can see we currently have this checkerboarded cube. And within our modify rib node, we're using the replace mode to set a color, a surface, and actually describe some geo, in this case, a small sphere. So if I go ahead and enable my modify rib, of course we're going to replace that geometry at render time. This replace mode, however, doesn't only have to happen on a single object. In this case, I've got two objects coming in, a cylinder and a cube, and of course, they both have different values. So the cylinder in this case is a little bit smaller than the cube. Now at render time, if I go ahead and enable the my modify rib, we're gonna get two of exactly the same spheres that we had before, but it'll also, of course, be taking those scale values into account. Finally over here, I've got the world setting. So inside my modify rib node, operation is set to world, and I'm describing a lot of things in here. If I just give us a little bit more space, you can see that at the very top I'm defining two point lights, underneath which I'm defining a sphere and then a torus. So with absolutely nothing hooked into my modify rib node, I can view my final result and see our newly constructed scene. Now a good way to possibly utilize this workflow is to use proxy geo within your nuke scene and then switch it out at render time. So let's say that we wanted to use something like this where we've got a proxy robot of course invading our nuke script. What I'm going to do is allow you to go into my modify rib node. I've hooked up to a rib archive in here using the mode replace and at render time if I just turn this on we're going to go from our low res robot over to our high res version. So of course this is just one of the many different ways that you can use this node but that is a quick look at the extended RenderMan integration in NukeX 6.3 v7. The next feature I want to take a look at, brand new to Nuke 6.3 v7, is our multi-UDIM support. So in this scene I've got this model of an anvil, but as you can see its texturing is looking a little bit strange. And the reason for this is that the model's UVs actually extend beyond the traditional 0 to 1 UV values. In fact, in this model's case, it's 0 to 4. Now, in previous versions of Nuke, there's not really much that we could do about this. However, in 6.3 v7, we can turn the model from looking like this to looking like this. In other words, textured correctly on every single UV patch, not only in 3D space, but also at render time. So I'm quickly going to come in and delete both of these nodes so I can do this from scratch and show you how you would implement this within your own workflows. So the first thing I want to do is come up here to this top menu and come down to UDIM import. And inside of here, we want to import an image for every single patch on our object. Now, one thing of note here is that this number at the very end of the file name, so 1001 to 1004, although it looks suspiciously like a frame range, in fact, it's not. This is what's termed the UDIM number, and it describes the patch that that current image will be applied to. So I'm going to select all of these images, I'm going to click open, and we're going to bring up this dialog which is basically Nuke's way of telling us which image it's applied to which patch. So in this case we can see patch 1001, it's gone through the file name and found that same value, so it's linked these two together. And it's done that of course for the other three patches as well. Now just of note, in case you have a different naming scheme at your own facility, you can absolutely extend this through Python and the instructions on how to do so are in the current version of the dev guide. At this point, you could potentially go ahead and use this Add Files button to bring in any other images you might want to add onto the model. Now, in the case of their UDIM numbers being the same, so if you have two files, both with this 1001 value, Nuke is going to add in something down here in this conflict line, telling you exactly what it's found and what the current problem is. Now, at that point, you could come in and disable one of these if you wanted to, so that you only have one image per UV patch. 
Now in this case I'm going to leave them all enabled because I know this is a very good setup that I've got here. And I'm going to come down to these bottom two options. Now these really affect how the nodes are going to be displayed in your comp. Uh, postage stamp will add a postage stamp to every one of these read nodes and group nodes is going to take the entire setup and group it up into a single node that you can plug then into your read geo. So I'm going to turn both of them on in this case and come down and click OK. Now with that done, Nuke has generated us a single group named after the file sequence that I was using, so in this case Blacksmith Anvil. I'm going to hook that into my read geo and as you can see everything is going to texture correctly. So let's have a quick look inside of this group and see exactly what's going on. Now there's two ways we can do that. First one is to double click the group and come up and click on this S button. The second way, my personal favourite, is to grab the group and hit Command or Control Enter. So inside the group itself, you can see there's several things going on here. First of all, at the top, we've brought in an image, a read node for every single one of those patches. Now underneath this, we have a new node called UV Tile. And inside of here, the script has gone through and automatically added in that UDIM number for us. So 1001, 1002, etc. Now if we wanted to, we could manually override this, or alternatively disable it and manually add in a U and V value. Now in this case, I'm going to toggle that back on because obviously our texturing is looking pretty good at this point. So underneath our UV tiles, we're using the merge material node to merge together every single one of those patches. And finally, at the very bottom, we have a brand new multi-texture node, which is just optimizing this setup both for 3D and for rendering. So that is just a very quick look at the brand new multi udem support that we have available to us within Nuke 6.3 v7. Of course, it's going to be very useful for those of you using Mari, for using the Nuke Mari bridge, and if you're using a multi udem workflow at your current facility.